there, this is Sia and La Cherise. And we are at recess, not at ease, but we just wanted to make sure on this uh, almost last day of session <laughs> that uh, we brought you an update. And so as you know, yesterday was supposed to be our last day, but we did extend the day so that we could continue uh, to finish our conference reports and get these last bills out. Uh, so we are uh, waiting for just a few more and then we'll be done for the day. And then, the basketball game was on, so that's why everybody's all out. But, um, <laughs> but you look but, like you might be annoyed by that. <laughs> but, hold, hold on one second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to last week's okay. <laughs> so we're really excited. Um, just a few quick things. So the reason why we have to extend um, the legislative session, there are a few reasons. Number one, our legislative rules say that when we're in a 60-day legislative session, everything needed to be done by basically yesterday at midnight. So we went ahead and extended that because the budget wasn't finished yet and we had a number of conference reports that were still pending. So now with the extension, we can finish our conference reports by six o'clock today and that is a firm, not changing again deadline, but that's with the exception of the budget. The budget is um, going to be presented or be made available tomorrow, but from the day the budget Budget becomes available you then must allow for 48 hours for both our inspection but also the general public's inspection um, before you actually cast any votes on it and so in this instance that's when we will come back on Thursday to cast votes on the budget and a conference report is when the house passed one version of the bill and the Senate passed another and we need them to be identical in order to get it to the governor uh, and so they are working on um, making sure that the bills get to identical so it might be a compromise it might take most of the things from one bill and some of the things from the other uh, but that's what the legislators are working on now uh, but some of the things that we were able to accomplish as of last night what was that vote last night on minimum wage so I'm sorry excuse the coffee but you know one of the things that makes it all worth being here is when you get to take votes on issues that you know people in your community people around Virginia care about deeply and one of those things happens to be minimum wage you know delegate Jawan Ward was a patron in the house and she has been a staunch supporter for workers for longer than we've been in office this has been the one issue that she has carried through and through and advocated for and so to see that come to fruition in the very late hours of the night was really one of those moments when you take a step back and you think this is what it's all about and so we started out in one place with minimum wage um, and we ended in another and that's okay because you have two bodies that this legislation needed to get through but with the compromise that was made we still are laying the foundation for more than 800,000 workers in Virginia to be in a position better than which they were before. So, really horrible fact, Virginia is known for having, you know, some of the worst wages throughout the country, and in the span of the next few years, we will change that tremendously. We will go from the current minimum wage upward to possibly $15 an hour, but more concretely, up to $12 an hour by 2023. And so Delegate Price can explain that incremental stairway, but last night was really a great reason to celebrate. And shout out to Raise the Wage advocates that have been really, really pushing us, that helped us from getting uh, to a great bill, to a really bad bill, <laughs> to like a pretty okay bill. And so uh, by January 1st, the minimum wage will be raised to $9.50, and that will be state wide $9.50 minimum wage uh, January 1st statewide and then the next year in 2022 it'll be $11 and then the next year in 2023 it'll be $12 and during that time up until 12 uh, 2023 uh, they will be studying what was proposed by the Senate which would have been a regional minimum wage um, basically there's already a study that says that it's trash and that it's based in racism and that it would be terrible for the uh, economy but you know what study it find out again that it would be really bad for Virginians but uh, but that's fine and then we would have to reenact it and then it would go um, even up to <laughs> sorry happy <laughs> women's Thanks, international <laughs> day too um, but it would continue uh, upwards to fifteen dollars by 2026 uh, if it should be reenacted. The other thing that this bill does is it includes more hardworking Virginians to be able to make the minimum wage by removing exclusions. So it's that double negative. So these exclusions were in there saying that they didn't have to get minimum wage. Now we took them out and so more people are able to get minimum wage and that is just a really, really great thing for Virginians 
and uh, quality of life and just the ability for you know people with kids to spend time with their kids because they might can have one job and so we know nine dollars and fifty cents is not a livable wage but it is closer and we're getting closer and, uh, and we I are think, really happy about that and I think it's important to, to just make it very clear that again this idea of laying the foundation is one that we believe strongly in there were some exemptions of workers in this legislation that we would have liked to see done differently but that it's, it's important for you to know that we're not giving up on that we're happy to where we were able to get this session but we will continue fighting for those workers that were excluded in the next go round yeah, and so the another major, major thing that um, we uh, we discussed that I think that you have heard from uh, both Delegate Aird and me, and that is about redistricting. And so we had the proposed constitutional uh, amendment that was before us, and it's called SJ, or Senate Joint Resolution 18. Um, we voted against it last year, and we spoke out even more this year because we had time. Last year, I can't remember like when we saw the conference report and we were voting. It was very, very quick. So we got up, and a few of us were able to get some of our points out. But um, over the last year, and even now, we've been able to get all of the points out. Uh, from Monday, we had a speech out by Jay Jones, and then um, you had speeches from a lot of the members of the House. Like Jeff um, that, Warren, <laughs> like, talking about what gaslighting yes, is. And, uh, in the House uh, Black Caucus, and um, I mean, Delegate Levine, Delegate Watts, Delegate Willett, um, Delegate Carter, I mean, just all, yeah, Scott. Krizak, yeah, Del Don Scott, like so many people speaking out about what was wrong with it. And so we are here, we are telling you, hear our words. Don't just read the articles that are trying to frame this as some power grab or some like beef between the Senate and the House. It's not that. It literally is about us properly choosing the words that we are going to put into our Constitution and making sure that they are the right words that include protections for communities of color. But then also, y'all, I've been in this chamber. This is my fifth session. I am telling you, you don't want legislators on this, cha this uh, commission to be drawing it. Currently as drawn, there will be eight legislators helping to draw uh, their districts and ready? speaking on behalf of their people. Uh, so the amendment is just bad and, and it passed. Come back, come so back, it's coming back. before you on your ballot. And then there was enabling legislation. Most of the good points that people have been saying about the amendment we're were actually about the enabling legislation. The enabling the legislation business. had to go into conference. And while it was in conference, we had the opportunity to vote out enabling legislation that if the proposed constitutional amendment should fail, it would kick to an independent commission. And there was also a provision such that none of us could appoint ourselves to the commission. And then the other one was making sure that we keep in the provisions uh, that would have um, helped end prison gerrymandering. Uh, so we really got to a great piece of enabling legislation in the conference report, but unfortunately it was rejected. Uh, so we will see what we're able to get to, but I really think if you guys want to choose to have legislators at the table, cool, but if not, and if you vote no to SJ18, the other option should have been for you all to get the independent commission that I know is what most of you wanted. Uh, and then, of course, we should not have legislators appointing ourselves to things. So those were the provisions that we had in there. We'll see what happens, but uh, that conference report was rejected, meaning that that's not what it's going to say. Um, short of that, like we're trying to get to a better product. We've been trying to get to a better product this whole time. It's super, super important what we put into our constitution. So stay tuned for more. And on that point, just two things really quickly. I just want you to know that I know that probably was a lot to take in. And for many people that I've been talking to about this, they want an opportunity to fully digest. So please, please, please stay tuned to both of our pages. We are going to allow you to see the remarks that were made on the floor so that you really get the essence of what multiple people of diverse perspectives and understandings were describing in that moment about why this was so, so bad 
was a horrible thing to do. It sets horrible precedent, not just for Virginia, but for other states around the country that want to look to see how can we actually do this? How do we get to an independent process where officials are not at the table doing this for themselves? And so there will be so much more information um, that will be provided from both of us on this. So please look for the links, look for the videos, and I can guarantee you a few things. That's going to be, we will be in all of these communities, including our own, talking about what we need to do in November to defeat this amendment. Now, one of the other major things that we are still here for, or part of the reason why we were held over, is because our budget was yet to be completed. There are so many important initiatives that was uh, present in the House version of the budget that was not in the Senate version. And we've described this previously, but essentially when you have two budgets that have set opposite priorities, they go into conference. Well. The conference meetings were uh, a bit tense, if you will, because people are very passionate about what they believe we should be funding in the Commonwealth. And so we're pleased to have Chairman Luctorian actually here with us making a special appearance to really talk to us about what he's proud of when it comes to this budget and what we can expect to see in this budget. Chairman Torian, will you give us a little bit about what we can expect to see in this historical budget under your leadership. Right. No, I, mean, I think that uh, we were extremely excited about the work that we've done to support uh, Norfolk State University and Virginia State <laughs> University. We have historic record support in this year's biennium budget for both of those institutions, and we appreciate the work that they do in the Commonwealth, how they provide quality education for our students throughout Virginia. And so that was one of our our uh, earmarked uh, efforts this year, and so we're excited about providing those uh, funds for those institutions. Chairman Torman, can you tell us what the process is from here on out? What, what does the body still have to do to fully approve your budget? The process from here on out, uh, this coming Thursday, we will gavel in, and then we will give a budget briefing to the House, and after we've given the budget briefing to the House, we will return to the chamber and then both uh, House Bill 29 and House Bill 30 will be voted upon. And then once they are voted upon and approved and signed into law by the governor, then both of those institutions will have access to the funding beginning July 1. Well, I just want to say that we are extremely proud of, yes, uh, Jeff Finch, the gentleman from Prince William County. I don't think everyone really fully knows that, uh, you know, Chairman Torian is the first uh, black man to serve in the position of pretty much one of the most powerful positions in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. We're especially proud of him for standing firm on things like secondary and elementary education, making sure that our public employees uh, receive the necessary compensation that they deserve. I mean, just taking a landmark positions that uh, we want to show that Democrats support families, we want to continue to uplift our families, and we want to make sure that we are fiscally sound as a Commonwealth of Virginia for years to come. And so we encourage you to tune in to not just the rest of this session, but when we come back on Thursday to talk specifically about the budget, because if you follow the money, that is the first indicator of the things that a state prioritizes. And more importantly, it'll be the first indicator of the stark differences of funding when it comes between the different parties and where we would like to see our money invested. So we're just extremely uh, proud of this budget. I hope that we will be able to show that to you and yeah. of this chairman. Sorry. Absolutely agree. And then just know, just like with any of the uh, bills that we were talking about, and just like with the budget, we know what we came here to fight for. We know what we want for our district, uh, but these bills have to pass both chambers. And so, yes, we may not have gotten everything that we wanted. The bill may not look like how we would have personally written it, but if it does better than status quo, we are going to uh, continue to work to improve. Um, you know, I, I did not come here for excruciatingly slow incremental change. And so uh, I came here with a progressive agenda that I actually did really well on for what I was fighting for. And then some of these larger items didn't have everything we wanted, but they did make progress. And so this year we made progress, but that just gives us even more to work on next year uh, as we're gonna continue this. And I just wanna say I have 
thoroughly enjoyed uh, serving this fifth year with my seatmate and my friend and my sister. We serve on the uh, um, general laws uh, committee together in the housing and consumer protection subcommittee and we also serve together on health, welfare and institutions and just understand that every time we speak we are speaking for our entire district, but we are specifically speaking for those that cannot get to Richmond and cannot make sure that their lived experience is being shared. And so we're going to continue that. But the best way that we can continue that is that if you continue to reach out to us and continue to tell us about your lived experience here in Virginia. So if there are problems and issues that you are encountering, uh, systemic changes that need to be made, uh, we definitely need to hear from you. And even if neither one of us are your delegate. If you want to reach out um, because you just need someone to fight for you, just know that, that we are here. Reach out to us. I personally don't try not to do business in the DMs. I definitely do not use Facebook Messenger, but our emails will be uh, available and uh, and we'll have our, our links to our YouTubes so that you can see previous episodes of At Ease, just in case <laughs> this is your first one. Uh, and we can go back to when we first started these. So they'll be posted. Our speeches from this session will be posted especially about redistricting but all of these issues that we're working on uh, we are going to be giving out newsletters and and updates so make sure you've signed up for both of our email newsletters and that you're paying attention to the events that we'll be having uh, post uh, veto session on April 22nd uh, again we're coming back to vote on that budget on Thursday and then veto session April 22nd and so that is our immediate future anything else you want to add no I think she's covered it um, I just want to say that that we appreciate all right I guess I have two things to say number one if you can't hear the congestion in my voice that's a great reminder that yes in Virginia we have had our first case of the coronavirus that it has, wasn't you though right it wasn't me really the, forgive her she yeah forgive her Sorry. we have had our first case identified and so this is just your daily reminder at this point because it's on the news everywhere to just continue to wash your hands don't touch your face. Uh, wash all surfaces that you use regularly. For example, your cell phone. Um, and, and just be vigilant. Although the low, uh, the spread of risk is said to be very low, don't take it for granted. Continue to just practice really great and high uh, sanitary standards as we all try to combat um, this virus that is going around. Number two, we would just like to, I would say I'm speaking on behalf of both of us when I say just thank you for your participation because, you know, we would do these starting out just for fun, not really knowing if everyone is watching or if they're helpful, but we have found that people have engaged and have found that this to be a useful resource for them. And so were it not for you, we may not have been um, participating and continuing to do these for you. And so we look forward to continuing to bring you these updates. And we just want to say thank you for all of your participation along the way as well. Absolutely, and don't forget, April 1st is Census Day. Oh, so not April Fool's Day. <laughs> it's both, but but the census is super important for us to make sure that we have uh, representation because the 435 members, voting members of Congress, will be spread out based on census data, and then um, the way that our districts are drawn with with redistricting, and then also in 2015, 675 billion dollars was sent out around the country based on census data, and then also we have demographic information, knowing who we are comprised of, who are we, uh, what are our lives like um, but you can fill out your census on the phone on the internet or in uh, on paper and I think they're also still hiring and in, in Newport News you can earn up to like twenty dollars and fifty cents an hour so the census is super important you will hear about the census for me until it's done it only happens once every ten years and whatever the count is this year is the data that will be used for the next 10 years. For every person that goes uncounted, it is estimated that $2,000 per year would be, um, <laughs> would be, um, <laughs> would be lost uh, about $2,000 per year. So that's $20,000 per person. So for like 500 people in Newport News, if 500 people were to go uncounted, that's $10 million over the 10 years. And I know each year there's a million dollars that we could come up with, that we could spend, and I know Mayor Price could find some ways uh, to use that money to make Newport News even better, but just want to make sure that everybody is filling out their census. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for watching, sending us your questions, continue to stay engaged, and uh, we will 
see you on Thursday when we come to Richmond to vote on the budget. All right, bye. bye.